Hello and welcome to another very special episode of the Sales Ops Demystified podcast. We welcome today Michelle Kuzman, who is currently the Sales Operations Manager at Electric. Now, I'm looking forward to this conversation for two reasons. First of which is that uh, Michelle has sales ops experience at a few different companies so we can compare and contrast. And the other reason is before we were chatting here, Michelle was saying that actually her whole career has been sales operations. So Michelle, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So I normally ask, how did you get into sales operations? And sometimes people come from sales or they come from marketing, but you were saying that actually this is everything that you've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I'll give you some some background of how I got into it. Um, in my junior year of college, I, I studied finance at Babson. Um, I was looking for uh, internships and experience. So I actually landed a finance internship at HubSpot, um, which was a great experience. And I kind of got an intro to like SaaS unit economics, like LTV and CAC um, type stuff. And it was actually there that uh, my manager recommended that I look into EMC for uh, rotational programs that they offered. Um, she was kind of leading me into the finance training program, but upon my research, I actually learned that there's an operations rotation program. And I even learned that I had a friend who was in that program themselves. So I kind of got exposed to, um, operations through that way. And I applied directly into that program. Um, and that's where I started my, my full-time career. I graduated Babson with a finance degree and then, joined EMC into a three-year uh, rotation program. So the way it worked, it was every year you were um, you were self-selecting a role within the global business operations uh, function of like 200 operations professionals. And you were specifically focused on uh, that one role. So my first year, I was doing um, financial planning and analysis, so doing a lot of forecasting and variance analysis for the America's sales org. Um, my second year, I did um, global sales compensation strategy, so I was looking at all the different sales roles we had, and it was a huge company, right? Uh, thousands of sales individual contributors, and so we had um, a sales function for pretty much every product line every type of role from inside sales to account executive to solution engineer to uh, you know implementation specialist so lots of different roles to strategize compensation for and then my last year um, was actually the year where when um, Dell acquired EMC and I was really interested in being a part of the integration and understanding what it meant um, for one large company to acquire another large company and to unify the sales, um, the sales force from like a process systems and people perspective. So I was kind of a, a project manager in um, helping facilitate the integration from um, a, the sales orgs perspective. So that's kind of how I got into sales ops. And from there, um, I, I always knew I wanted to be kind of in a startup world and an entrepreneurial environment. Um, so I wanted to take what I kind of got as a foundation from EMC and went way smaller to like, you know, 100 to 300 person companies. Um, that's where I was at Actifio, then Better Cloud and now Electric. Um, so that's kind of the environment that I find I'm flourishing most in where it's a lot smaller and you're not just hyper-focused on one specific role within sales operations, but you actually have your hand in the whole entire thing because it's a much smaller um, a much smaller machine, so you have to kind of run with it, all aspects of it. Got it. And then zooming in to Electric today, how many sales reps are there and how many people within the sales ops or ops team? Yep, so we have tw- like around 12 AEs around 12 SDRs, and then we have a customer success org, which is actually not part, uh, not part of my preview. Um, so the sales team that I support is uh, 24 and, and, and growing. Um, and we have something very unique at Electric. It's actually the first place that I've seen such um, 
such an investment and support of operations in ratio to the sales org. And it's proving itself and it's, uh, it's proving it's like, uh, it's worth because we're able to really support um, the sales team from a, like a much deeper lens. So our team is um, five sales ops professionals and we uh, work closely with a lead gen associate to help us build out our database too. So um, it's actually a pretty robust team given the sales size, sales team size. Um, and it really allows us a lot of flexibility um, to really go deep into topics that otherwise we would not be able to do um, had we not had that many resources. And that's like a bullish on sales operations, right? I think this is the greatest, I track ratios. This is a one to five ratio of ops yeah. to rep. Um, that's incredible. So yeah, you guys must be doing some really awesome stuff. Yeah, no, we're having a lot of fun. Um, we're doing a lot of cool stuff. We get to work on a lot of different projects. And the beauty of having so many people on the team is that we can really go like, you know, when we think of a project, we can actually go tackle it. There's a lot of times when you're the, the sole sales operations person and you just need to get through like the day to day. You don't get to go explore like, you know, you have a new idea on running an ICP analysis or, oh, what would it mean to target this industry? Like those are a lot of the times wish list items that um, really small sales ops orgs don't get to explore. And given our size, um, we're really, we are able to do that and really support the sales team and sales leadership with any idea um, or initiative that we want to run. Got it. And what's the current sales tech stack at Electric? Yep. So we use Salesforce as our CRM uh, outreach as our prospecting engagement tool. We recently rolled out Gong, which is super cool. Um, you know, we're we're pretty new customers, but like you know, a month in post implementation, but it's proving to be an awesome tool for us. Um, in terms of prospecting, like Zoom Info, LinkedIn Sales Nav, and then uh, we use Zora for like quoting. Got it. Awesome. Um, can you share a project that? You might not have been able to do, but you but you guys can because you have so many ops resources that have had like a material impact on the productivity of either the AEs or the FTRs or both. Yeah, for sure. So one thing that I noticed when I joined was that like it kind of goes with data quality too, is um the taxonomy of industries of how we identify what industry a company is. And when I came in, what we had was an open text field in Salesforce, which was industry. So essentially, you can type in whatever way you want to classify an industry. You can call something food or you can call something, you know, um, you know, food store. You can call it alcohol. Or you can call it beverage. And essentially, when you have an open text field like that, there's no way to run any sort of standardized analytics because everything is just like, you know, you could write and, or you can use the ampersigns. Like that makes a difference when you when you when you run data. So um, that was an op- like one of the first opportunities where if it was just a, a team of one, like it would have been really difficult to not only one come up with a new taxonomy, but number two, the harder part would what is cleanup, right? So we were able to come up with a really unique um, way of classifying industries. And I can tell you a little bit about that. Essentially, like even LinkedIn will classify an industry um, in a very like in a in their in their own specific way. So something like Uber can be both considered a tech company and a transportation company. And we felt like LinkedIn, um, the NICS codes, all of that were not standard. Or we're not like fully reflective of all the different ways we wanted to understand what industry a company is in. So we actually came up with our own um, taxonomy, which is a primary industry of like what industry does that company service. So Uber services like transportation, and then a go-to-market field, which is how do they do it? Is it tech? Is it product? Is it services? And now you have this like bifurcation of industry um, that you can run an analysis on. Is it, oh, it's a tech company, but what kind of tech company is it? So, you know, it took us some time to even come up with that taxonomy of like a 
drop down uh, list item. So you're not like typing in your own version of an industry. But then it took us a lot of time to clean up the hundreds and thousands of accounts that that we have like dirty data on. Um, and that was only thanks to like a team wide effort that we were able to go back. We cleaned up. We started with only cleaning up like our closed one accounts, our customers. Um, and then we went to look at clean up uh, accounts that had opportunities. And now over time, it's a required field. Anytime a salesperson wants to uh, prospect into the account, they have to um, follow you know those two fields, and they have a drop down list. So there's no room for like you know messy data because you only have the options that you have to click through. Got it. That's definitely something that. I can't see a kind of starved ops team getting to do. <clears throat> That's super interesting, right? So you had, you actually split industry into two. Yeah. And so when you were able to go back and look at all the closed one deals, were there any insights that came out where you were like, actually this type of go-to-market strategy we serve better or we have more of these? Yeah, absolutely. So we were able to like look at, for example, you know, tech is a really strong, we, we ran an ICP analysis that was only able, we were only able to run it because of this clean data. Um, so that was actually like a great question. That was the genesis of that project was um, I was asked to do an ICP analysis. And when looking at the industries that in the prior state, it was pretty much impossible to do because everything was super messy. Um, So that was actually the genesis of that project. And then six months later, we were able to rerun that project. And we were able to learn a lot of um, interesting tidbits of information that then um, then informed like marketing efforts. So, for example, um, we learned that, you know, nonprofits are a really um, interesting space for us. And um, further, after doing some further research, it makes a lot of sense. It wasn't previously an industry that the sales team really was focused on. But what we were finding uh, it was that uh, nonprofits try to reduce overhead costs, and we are an outsourced uh, IT support company. So that made a lot of sense. And um, we typically see that you know the conversion rates on nonprofits were a lot higher um, than 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 the average um, than the average company. So that was an interesting tidbit that we learned. And then overall, um, tech is a good you know the the go to market of tech is strong for us. But by being able to look at tech split out by primary industry, we were able to see what kinds of tech are good for us. So we learned that like fintech, edtech, marketing and advertising tech is great, um, and that's those are insights that we were only able to gather because of the industry taxonomy that we rolled out. And this is like absolute, this is like sales ops in its best, right? Where you're able to analyze what's happened in the sales process to then feed back to help marketing and sales going forward. That's like, this is like gold. Um, yeah, no, it's awesome. We're, we're excited about it. So a slightly different question. I assume you guys might have been doing more remote work over the past few weeks. Have you, you have any advice or is there anything you've learned by doing that that could help other sales ops people listening? Yeah. So, I mean, I think with everything that's going on right now, it's cliche, but communication, communication, communication has been like, I think the saving grace for, um, for our company. We've actually seen like, I've, like we all would prefer to be in person in the office, but we've only we've seen the same level, if not more, amount of productivity and mo- sales momentum right now, um, which is so amazing and encouraging to see that like a it's product validation. Like our company is able to help prospects um, through this time because we are remote and because people are more remote right now. So that's been really really cool to see. But in terms of internal operations. We have like morning stands and afternoon stands. Morning stands, we talk about what projects we're working on. Um, like early, early evening around 4.30, we'll sync. We'll like, you know, have just like a fun conversation about like how your day was, whatever. And then any updates and any blockers that, that we need help um, resolving. So like we meet twice a day as a sales ops team. Um, the sales team overall has two stands weekly. And that's been that's not because of the remote situation. We've always had that, but we maintain it um, Mondays and Friday mornings. 
And then we also have like a Friday evening, like wins um, session. So we, we go around the whole entire sales org. So it's like AEs, SDRs, managers, sales ops. Um, it's like, you know, upwards 40 people. And everyone says something that, you know, personal win and a work win. So I think overall, like in terms of internal operations, we're just, uh, we've done a really good job of just staying very well connected with each other, whether it be through cadences or just like hopping on quick calls. Um, so yeah, it might be cliche, but like we've just stayed very much um, in contact uh, and made sure that like things don't fall through the cracks. I uh, put down here communication cubed instead of saying communication three times. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also a question. If you could only measure one sales related metric for the rest of your career, which would you choose? Um, so I'll say, I'll give you my answer, but there's, there's always the, it depends piece of it. Um, so I don't like, I'll say it's win rate, but it, again, it depends on how you measure, measure win rate. Um, based on win rate, you can, um, you're able to forecast the amount of pipeline that you need. You're able to forecast um, a landing position at the individual, at the team level. But what I want to say more about win rate is how you define it, because you can define it in many different ways. And that's where I think people can get caught up sometimes is, okay, your win rate is 20% based on what? Or if it's 5% based on what? You can throw out a number, and the number can either excite or scare a board member or an investor, but it depends on how you're defining it. If you're talking about win rate at the last stage of the sales cycle being 90%, yeah, that sounds great. But um, that's one thing that we've been very focused on is looking at the sales cycle through its progression. So like, when do you consider the start of an opportunity? I've been at different companies and there's many different ways to do it. You can say an opportunity is when the meeting is created, the day the meeting is created. You can say an opportunity is when the meeting is held. You can say an opportunity is when the meeting is qualified. And based on all those different um, kind of checkpoints of a life of the life cycle, the win rate can change, can increase or decrease. So um, we have it as the the birth of an opportunity is upon meeting creation, like the day that an SDR or an AE you know, calls a prospect and they said, yep, we're, w- we're willing to have a conversation. That's, you know, you create an opportunity. Um, but then we have stages that that stage is called discovery stage, stage one. And then we have a stage called develop, which is um, the stage where you hold the demo. And so we track, we track, we track the win rate across all stages, but specifically we want to look at how many opportunities get to the demo stage, and then what's the win rate from the demo stage and beyond. So um, I think, you know, win rate is very powerful and it's a helpful indicator and it's a helpful tool to help plan around sales cycle and pipeline and pipeline contribution and landing position, but it all depends on how you measure it so that you can tell the accurate story. It's a little long-winded, but um, I wouldn't be doing just as if I were just say to just say just win rate <laughs> for sure very very important that you clarified so it's from when that the F, the day the FDR creates the or books the first meeting that's when the opportunity starts and then you're measuring right through to the end where the close one or left that's the that's the percentage yeah I mean you can and it's not the right way there's you know you can do it I've seen it be done in, in many different ways but it just depends on how your what your rate is telling you so if you're measuring the win rate just from the start of the, you know, when you book the meeting, it's going to be lower because you're going to have no shows. You're going to have cancellations. Um, so what we do is we track, you know, the meeting is created. How many of those meetings? It's like a, a stage movement rate. So we, we, we measure opportunity gets created. Percentage of those opportunities move to develop plus pipeline. And then from there, how much of it gets won? So that's like a develop plus win rate. So we measure we measure two parts of the funnel across all the different sources, across marketing, across SDR, across AE. Um, so yeah, we measure it from a specific point, and we measure how many opportunities get to that point. Got it. Awesome. Who would you say have influenced or educated you the most in the world of sales operations? 
Uh, two people for different for different purposes. Um, my current manager, Kevin Ward, director of sales ops, has been really huge in kind of coaching me in like cross functional communications and being able to upskill my effectiveness in communicating. Um, so that's been really really big for my career, being able to communicate effectively, be able to tell the right story in the right way to the right audience. He's really big on catering your message to the right audience. You wouldn't, you, the way you would say something to a sales executive is maybe different than the way you would present it to an AE, maybe different than the way you would present it to a marketing executive. So um, that's been really hugely helpful for me um, and just having like a sharp lens on that perspective and then I would also say, actually, Ashley Curran, who was my second manager at EMC um, when I was working in global sales compensation. She was really big on training my mind in like process and structure, um, how to problem solve, and, as well as how to create like um, good document process documentation and even like slide design how to make it very easy to understand the message by making it look visually appealing but also deliver the right message with not too much clutter and like even like small but big things like sent how to center align um you know boxes on a slide like um so things like that i would say those those two um have been the biggest uh impact in my career Got it. Awesome. Well, normally I name a few things I like from the episode, but here I only want to talk about one because I think it's so, such an interesting story and so insightful how you went to do an ICP analysis, found out that there was a specific field that wasn't constrained. You went through the, the exercise of not just constraining, but also spitting out and then feeding the learnings from that analysis back into the sales process and back into marketing. I think that's an incredible, like, case study and if any sales person is looking to like justify the value of their team to leadership they should do stuff like this right yeah yeah absolutely i mean like finding a problem is step one devising a solution is step two step three is executing and step four is proving why it was valuable in the first place um so i think everything that we do we're super intentional on we have a reason why we're doing it and we're able to justify that reason to sales leadership of um, this is why it's going to add value to you. You know, like even something like we're going, you know, we're finishing out the quarter right now and we need to prepare um, new queues of accounts for our sales team. And that requires input from the sales team of doing cleanup, which like isn't fun. <laughs> you know, we need to get them to do this because if they don't do it, then they're not going to get accounts from other people's uh, prior account ownership. So it's like justifying, you know, yeah, you know, we're, we're asking you to do this like annoying thing, but this is how it's going to help you. Um, and that's like, the, that's the lens that we do everything um, for sales operations at Electric. Like we have a reason and a purpose for everything we do. Um, and it's all very like strategic and thoughtful. Um, so yeah, I definitely like, there are really easy ways to prove value for the sales ops team. Sometimes it's, seen it like you know it's an afterthought but it's really really core to the the sales engine um even when i started i created like a slide one of the electrics onboarding uh processes across the, con the across the company was like present to your starter class like what your organization does so i created a slide where actually I, like i had a human body like anatomy and i like designated each like part of the body with a function. So for example, like the face is like sales and marketing, you know, where you're the face of the company. Um, you know, the, the blood is finance. It keeps the finances going and it is the lifeline of, of the company. And then sales ops is the spine. It's actually like the structure that you don't necessarily see, but without it and without, um, you know, without a strong, you know, spine that is in line, other things will also fall apart and the, you know, the person will be able to stand up straight. So um, yeah, there's a lot, like I clearly love <laughs> my job and I am passionate about the sales ops space. And um, there's a lot that a sales ops professional can do to justify and prove value uh, to the rest of the company. And that's the first time I've heard the sales ops 
is a spine analogy. So we'll finish that. Michelle, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you.